Okay, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you know, I'm Michael Rothberg, and on behalf of the UCLA Allen D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, um, I would like to welcome you to this seminar uh, with Professor Mariana Hirsch of Columbia University. Uh, Mariana is here for the week and doing various events, and um, we will give a more formal introduction uh, tomorrow, but as always, we are we're grateful to the, to the Levy Center staff, to the 1939 Society um, for, for helping provide the funds for these events, and, and, and everyone else who played a part in this, in making this possible. Um, yeah, I'll give a more formal introduction tomorrow, but I do want to say it's really uh, a great pleasure to, to have Mariana here. She's been a, a mentor, a colleague, and a friend for many years. Um, unparalleled in the in the in the profession, um, Mariana Hirsch is the William Peterfield Trent Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, where she's also a professor in the Institute for Research on Sexuality and Gender, uh, a program you have uh, directed yeah. and maybe played a role in establishing. No, no, directed. Okay, directed. Um, before she came to Columbia, she taught for many years at Dartmouth College, which is where I first met her. Uh, of her work. Um, she has so many accomplishments, I really can't uh, mention them all, but I'll mention she's been the president of the MLA. Um, she has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, she's received fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation, the ACLS, the American Academy in Berlin, and various other places. Um, she is the author or editor of many, many books. Um, all of us here, I think, know her, especially, of course, for her work on post-memory, a term, a concept that she uh, invented, <laughs> conceptualized, and that has been so incredibly gen generative for so many of us, and so many people really around the world, working in lots of different um, areas. Um, her contributions are, um, so significant to many different fields, uh, literary studies, of course, uh, feminist studies, I think, from the beginning. Um, and, and then, of course, Holocaust studies, memory studies, and, and the field of visual culture studies, with a particular focus on photography. Right? So these are just some of the fields to which uh, she has contributed uh, in books like Family Frames, uh, Photography, Narrative, and Post Memory, of course, the generation of post memory uh, more recently. She's also um, a, a real collaborator, and I think we're going to see evidence of that in today's seminar, the project she's going to be talking about. But it comes out, of course, in other work as well. I'm thinking, for example, of the 2019 book, Women Mobilizing Memory, which came out of a multi year project, really transnational feminist project working with women in Turkey, in Chile and other places around the world, and a really fascinating volume that came out of that around memory activism and art and this sort of thing. And she's also done, um, uh, has a long history of collaborating with Leo Spitzer uh, on two books in particular, Ghosts of Home, The Afterlives of Chernovitz in Jewish Memory, and then a recent and really fascinating book that we discussed in my seminar a couple of years ago, School Pictures in Liquid Time. Um, so these are just some of the accomplishments of Mariana Hirsch, and today she's going to be talking about a new collaborative, activist-oriented project, as I understand it, called the Zip Code Memory Project. And we're so glad to have you with us, and Mariana is going to introduce this project to us, and we're going to have lots of time for discussion. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Wonderful introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me, Sarah. It's wonderful to meet you. Lovely to see some of you again and to have had a chance to talk yesterday. And Michael, thanks for shepherding this through. Um, and for giving me the chance to talk about this in this uh, you know, sort of intimate setting. So we're, here we are, 2022, uh, two years after the pandemic started. And of course, we've all had lots of time in isolation and with other people on Zoom and on 
uh, by ourselves and in classes on Zoom to think about the work we've been doing and how it's going to continue to be relevant or how we have to change it and what this present moment brings. And for me, after two years of this moment, it's been, or, you know, first a year, but now even more, trying to figure out what my work in memory studies can contribute to thinking about the present. So of course, memory studies about the past and how the past lives on in the present, how it points to the future. But are this, is this idea of the future and of the past and of time, how we think about time, how has this moment impacted how we think about time? And I'll be talking about this some more tomorrow as well. But particularly, um, you know, I, I want to talk about this project, but the way I'm going to talk about it is through a text that I actually wrote out because I was asked to uh, contribute to a podcast, which is called Connecting Memories. Do you know it? Or have you been in it? Um, so it's a scholar from Edinburgh who interviews scholars in memory studies. And he has issued a series, a series of podcasts. I think this is maybe the second edition or the third that's coming out, starting in April. But he asked me to be interviewed for it, and I thought I want to do something about right now. And uh, so it will. It's supposed to air on Friday, which is the second anniversary of COVID. So I, I sort of urged him to do it earlier. And of course, already it was taped several weeks ago, already things have changed because when I when we when I had the conversation with him we were in the midst of Omicron and now we're not. You know, so it's and, and we're in the midst of a war. So you know the present moves very fast, but I think some of the reflections, some of the ways we're reflecting on it um, move very fast as well and we have to stop for a second and think. So I will try to define what this present moment is and I see it both as a kind of we seem to be in a moment of suspension. Maybe it always seems that way, but you know, when we make plans, when we think about the past, when we conceive our fields and think about time, and I, I've never quite experienced this suspended present that's also a continual emergency. And that's, that's the best way I can describe it, and I'd love your feedback on whether that seems right and how we can conceptualize this um, combination of emergency and suspension. Um, the, 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 you know, is, does it make sense to go to the past for any guidance, for any um, analogies, which we do all the time, the 1918 flu, uh, Hitler and Putin, I mean, we're all constantly grasping for that, but is that, you know, a good way to go? The future seems ever more contingent and uncertain. Um, so, you know, what about ways in which we've conceived of time and of memory? Is it is the idea of traumatic return still the you know the way to think? Um, never mind progress and linearity of time, which I think we've given up a long time ago. So the question is sort of what has what does memory studies and the way we've conceived of time help us? Um, I'm going to talk about this project, but I wanted first to think about ways in which the losses of COVID-19 can and will be memorialized. Um, of course, you know, in order to emerge as a community, a global and local community, you have to, in order to think about building or rebuilding from such enormous loss, memory and commemoration is really important. But do the paradigms of commemoration that we've inherited from other histories, other losses, other violent histories, um, are they appropriate for thinking about COVID-19? Um, I was thinking probably not. We really need to think of our very own, that this moment will require its own commemorative paradigms. And we still don't know what those should be. Of course, individuals and communities and families are mourning losses. They're mourning losses in the middle of um, you know, continual emergencies still having to remain distant from each other. There were so many years, so many months where people couldn't even gather for funerals. And communities have been splintered through isolation and people have suffered a great deal of isolation and loneliness. So what does it mean to mourn losses in this, in this context? What does togetherness mean? What does community even mean in the context of all this loss? And also when the virus has revealed radical inequalities in our social fabric, 
not just in the US, but globally. Um, so in these circumstances, um, how can communities move forward? Um, and especially in terms of memory and commemoration, how can, what kinds of paradigms would be able to bridge the gap between the depth of individual commun and communal loss, of familial loss, and the magnitude of collective national and global loss, which are all unevenly un and unjustly distributed. I mean, that gap seems so enormous to me, I don't know what commemorative paradigms could somehow do justice to it. So these are some of the questions that a year ago, some of my colleagues and I were asking ourselves. And these are colleagues who work together on other collaborative projects, especially with the mobilizing memory that Michael just mentioned, where we got together with artists, scholars, artists, and activists from Chile, from Turkey, from other parts of the world, from the US, to think about how memories of painful past could be mobilized for a more just future. And the book um, Michael mentioned came out in 2019. But some of us continued to talk and to work together. And we had spent all this time studying you know, catastrophes across the globe. Uh, suddenly, we were home uh, a lot more. And we realized, can we turn our attention to some of our very own communities to ask some of the very same questions? And that seemed particularly urgent in New York City, where I live and work. And you know, the, the name of this project, the Plot Memory Project, emerges from, I don't know how you all study where the virus was most virulent in LA, but in New York we kept staring at the zip code map and it was color coded and the you know my zip code 10025 was usually sort of pink or orange, but two zip codes up it was brown and black from you know the rates of infection, from the you know the rates of the death rates, eventually vaccination rates. Um, and there were just enormous inequities in very neighboring sites where Columbia, my university, is located. So it's located in the midst of these very, very differential um, effects of COVID. It is, this is a community with large Black and Latinx and immigrant and undocumented populations with a vast inequities in sustainable infrastructure and education and health. Um, and um, certainly women for disproportion in front of the, of, of, of the losses here. Um, so the question became, you know, we live in the midst of this, you know, these inequalities and the very differential effects of COVID, what can we do? Um, and so this is how this project was born. Um, my collaborators, I mean, there were five of us uh, planning it. and we thought we might be able to do what we do, which is bring the arts to bear on, um, on forms of healing. Um, and to um, mobilize what I think of as more recent directions in memory studies, which are not so much trauma and it's repetition oriented, but that have begun to highlight Discourses of care, of justice, of mutual aid, of repair, of futurity, which I think has become quite central to our field. And how could we, you know, um, do something locally and also and recognize some of the community's own mutual aid work and work of care and honor those, um, even as we we figured out ways to measure the loss and to, um, and to acknowledge loss and think about strategies of repair. So it's called Zip Code Memory Project, uh, Practices of Justice and Repair. We, it, I worked together with Diana Taylor, who's a, stud, a, a scholar of performance studies at NYU, uh, with Susan Micellis, who's a noted photojournalist who's covered, you know, revolutions and wars all over the world and work in Kurdistan and Nicaragua um, with the artist uh, Lori Novak who is also at NYU and with uh, perform with uh, photography and American studies scholar Laura Wexler at Yale. So we were in a reading group. I mean this is so you know just sort of the genesis of how these kinds of projects emerge, right? We were in a reading group and uh, 
we started reading together early on in the pandemic and meeting on Zoom to read, you know, Ariella Azulay's latest book and, you know, Judith Butler's book on nonviolence. And we, so it, it sort of went like that. And then Laura Wixson and I actually taught a course together on Zoom during, you know, the first fall of COVID. And then the reading group <laughs> turned into a monster of uh, organizing this huge thing because we applied for some grants and uh, conceptualized this work and got a grant from Columbia and a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation to put this thing together. Um, so, um, you know, this, um, how did we do it? <laughs> we decided to, um, well, so let me first talk a little bit about the kind of theoretical underpinnings of what we wanted to do and how we wanted the, to bring the arts to bear on practices of healing. Um, so, you know, my work on post-memory, right, is very much based on how catastrophic histories are passed down to future generations. And, you know, I've argued that somehow we can actually remember or recall events that happened before we were born. And uh, we, you know, I, I think the, the conception of that, this argument about transmission, which is both intentional and unconscious, is based on the fact that um, these events are somehow lodged in the body and that they're actually transmitted in embodied fashion through, you know, we talked about this yesterday, through familial connections, but then they, that they can also powerfully, be powerfully transmitted through art practices, through behaviors, and through um, forms of representation. Um, so um, when I thought about, when we thought about the isolation of COVID and the disconnection between bodies, we also thought about how this history is very much lodged in the body. The body became a place of infection, uh, of mutual infection, of um, contagion. Um, and so the, the book we were reading that actually led to this pro project is Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score. I don't know how many of you have read it. I mean, it's no coincidence that this book, which was written in 2014, uh, became a bestseller uh, in, in last year, or, I mean, in 2020 or 2021. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk wrote some classic essays on trauma. They, was, they were collected in Kathy Garuth's early um, anthology on trauma. Uh, but what's interesting about The Body Keeps the Score is that this is a book about trauma and transmission, but it's really very much a book about healing and about strategies of healing and, uh, and healing and body practices of healing and community building. So he has, um, you know, years of history um, treating traumatized patients, primarily focusing on survivors of war and child sexual abuse. And of course, none of these things are parallel to what happened with COVID, but um, so his findings don't exactly fit the sort of punct punctual trauma of, trauma of pandemic bereavement, which are compounded by the you know, ongoing effects of racism, injustice, and inequality. But uh, somehow we found that his ideas about healing were very much enabling the kinds of work that we wanted to do. Um, so he investigates a number of therapeutic techniques. How many people have read it or parts of it? Yeah. So ranging from you know cognitive behavioral therapy, you know some some very well known things, EMDR, acupuncture, massage, yoga. I mean, really trying to figure out how uh, we can jettison disabling memories and move forward, and change not only the future but actually revise the past. And that became a kind of very compelling idea, to imagine different paths and different possibilities, different ways it could have been. And that is through acting exercises um, and through kind of forms of projection, uh, theatrical um, experiments especially. So Van der Kolk writes, in my experience, physically re-experiencing the past and the present and then reworking it in a safe and supportive container can be powerful enough to create new supplemental memories. 
simulated experiences of growing up in an attuned, affectionate setting where you are protected from harm. Okay, so this idea of the container, the safe and supportive container, um, so it's a kind of theater of memory where you can um, act out and transform disabling memories and the places where these memories sit in our bodies. So we can, we can transform and heal the very bodies that hold these memories. That's von der Kolk's, not just theory really, it's his practice. Um, so when we started um, conceiving this project, we thought, well, how can you construct a safe and enabling container? What would that mean for not only to heal you know, the, the losses of people and stores and community, um, you know, central spaces in a community, but really to try to rewrite the past in a way that it would lead to a different, different future. So we think of the Zip Code Memory Project as such a safe and supportive container. So we, um, we all are academics and activists, some of us. We're, you know, five white women um, and older white women. It's hard, you know, we're trying to build a project in Harlem, in Washington Heights, in the South Bronx, incredibly diverse communities. We're probably, you know, it's like Columbia University is the place that just expanded to Harlem and, you know, built new buildings and, you know, where some of the, their, these people's stores used to be. So it's not, you know, it's not an easy venture and uh, probably should have taken two years to build trust, to connect to different community organizations, but we sort of felt like the, it was, uh, the project was very urgent because we thought <laughs> a year ago that, uh, you know, now we have vaccines, the virus will be over, we're going to want to return to normal. How are people going to stop for a minute? How can we pause and measure the loss? Well, then exactly, it wasn't exactly the, the trajectory that we had in mind, but we felt the urgency and we got the grant, so we forged ahead. and with a lot of mistakes and imperfections. But what we did was, first of all, to build a team of workshop leaders to who would lead different art-based workshops, you know, young and diverse group of workshop leaders who would do um, workshops that are theater-based, Theater of the Oppressed, August of Wild workshops, and other kinds of theater-based workshops, but workshops that involve right, storytelling, writing, photography, uh, spoken word, um, so that, that that's sort of the range. Um, and then we were very fortunate to get um, donated um, a group of uh, graduate student, public humanities graduate students from a number of institutions, Columbia and NYU and Yale, but also uh, City College of New York. So we have a team of graduate students who are learning about public humanities and also working with the project. And we have curators who've been curating some public events. And we also knew that there had to be an academic component to this, not just the workshop. And the academic component is a series of roundtables on what we're calling reparative memory. And uh, the second one's coming up on March 31st. They're on Zoom, the first one. And so we, we invited you know, well-known memory artists who've, done, who've worked with communities in different parts of the globe to create memorials or memorial practice, memorial projects that involve very different kinds of histories, but uh, where their practice could, from their practice, we could learn something about what a COVID, COVID memorialization could be, or even a COVID memorial, which is still something we might, you know, in the future um, try to figure out. So these workshops, so this, the, our first, that first roundtable was fabulous with you know, Doris Salcedo and Hank Willis Thomas and Ava Wilson, I mean, Susan Marcellus herself, really a fabulous group who talked about, you know, different kinds of catastrophes and how uh, they can see uh, Michael Arad who talked about the World Trade Center Memorial. So each described their practice. The second uh, round table, which I can, I'll send you, um, it's also going to be on our website, um, will be with Memorial artists who are who real, are doing more participatory community projects that is that are closer to to ours. 
and one is by Rafael Lozano Hemera. I'm looking at his work as a Mexican Canadian artist and the project he's doing probably called this up um, is now at the Brooklyn Museum, but it's a it's a participatory project where people are donating photographs and a few lines about a person they lost and that those photos are transformed into a sand, a redrawn with sand and then printed. So it becomes a kind of sand painting. I'll pull it up in a little while. And uh, then the sand is reused for the next one. Um, and that's a really, really interesting project, which we're actually we're having an exhibition and we're going to have a satellite version of. Um, so it takes 30 minutes to turn a um, photograph of a person into ghost, really. But the process of reusing the sand, I mean, it's really, it's a very interesting project. So, so I, you know, I don't know how long I've been talking. I, I was just going to tell you a little bit about some of the workshops. Because, you know, being an academic and a writer and a thinker, it's very, you know, unusual for me to go to these theater-based workshops or to write poetry in a workshop or to make a spirit card, which I just did. And I mean, so it's very, and, you know, it's um, after, after um, building this team, we also partnered with a number of local arts and community organizations and churches because we needed to spread the word and we needed to build a group of participants. Our dream was to have four groups of 16 participants each, more or less, and they would go through this series of workshops. So very small and intimate, really, but a kind of template for other, you know, for doing this in other places. So we wanted to kind of build a, a toolkit that would then be replicable. Um, so how do you get people to sign up? And it's a lot to ask. You know, there were like, you know, a number of weekends in the fall and then in the spring again, and people really, we asked people to commit to the whole series because that's how it would work. Well, you know, uh, you know how it is. People have lives. People are still afraid to come out. So, the, you know, attendance hasn't been as consistent, but we do have four groups and we partnered with arts organizations like the Museo del Barrio, the Museum of the City of New York, the Studio Museum in, Har in, Har in Harlem, the Schomburg, but also some churches and some community organizations like the Dominican Cultural Center and you know spaces like that. We were hoping that they would get their people out. It's really, that is really interesting because museums don't actually have a constituency like that. They have people who come to their events or to their exhibition. They have a mailing list, but they don't, you know, but the churches actually do have a real, you know, um, constituency and actually, and so the people who joined were really interesting. A number of artists who were interested in the practice, but also wanted people to know about their work. A lot, number of people who, had really felt isolated and really wanted to be with other people. Um, some um, some older people, but we had a range of people who were nurses, teachers, kindergarten teachers, a number of immigrants who had even more recently moved to the neighborhood from various places. So very diverse group, ranging from about 16 to 80, um, and you know diverse in, in, in every possible way. And so what do you do? You, you get these, you know, you get this group in a room, even our team of people. How do you build trust? How do you get people, you know, how much confessional, how much do we want to learn about each other's losses? How do we get, you know, what's the ethical way to kind of deal with the depth of loss and sorrow that people have been experiencing, fear and distrust and anger and rage that people have been experiencing? Well. You know, you don't direct do it directly. You know, when we when we first met with our team with this amazing uh, workshop leaders, I'll show you our workshops. Um, good at Bell. I'm looking on this one. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks like it's doing it. Okay. 
So at first we, 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 we've been meeting at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, which is this wonderful space that they've welcomed us. So our first workshop is was this trust building uh, called um, Theater of the Oppressed. Do you all know about Augusto Ball, Brazilian? Yeah. Um, called Rehearsals from Ch for Change with George Emilio Sanchez, who's an amazing um, native Latino person who had actually studied with Boal. So just to give you an idea of the, this workshop, when we first met as a team, George Sanchez did not facilitate the beginning. We just wanted to introduce each other. And we asked people, where do you know COVID from? And so 35 people went around and it was amazing. Because, but these were graduate students and curators and, you know, but the it meet, you know, the way that people were just able to reveal so much in just a very short introduction. With community members, we didn't quite do that, but the way the Theater of the Oppressed um, works is that people act out, they, they make human sculptures, okay? So this first exercise, and, and you can use anybody in the, in the room to become part of your sculpture. So the first one was, it's called Rainbow of Desire, but you give people a prompt and then um, you create the sculpture. So this one, um, the, the first one, well, this was, you know, lock hands and disentangle. I mean, that's a lot of kind of silly play kind of stuff. But the, the first work, the first one was um, make a structure of power. Uh, and you have a chair, a table, and the people. And make one that's more powerful, more powerful. Then you have a conversation and you discuss it. And eventually, there's a workshop which we will, we're going to do with George in the spring called Image Theater. And in Image Theater, you make a sculpture with people that you choose about where are we now. And then you make a second sculpture, which is where do we want to be. And the third one is how do we get from here to there. And you have to act it out, not speaking or even just construct it. And uh, I think that's sort of you know, a very useful exercise anyway. I think that's pretty much what we should be asking ourselves all the time. Um, so these are the, you know, these are the workshops we did with uh, George Emilio Sanchez, and this is George. There's writing, people then read this journaling, people read their writing to each other. So after that first, this is the power one, after that first, and it, it was a uh, 10.30 to 3 with lunch, day, people bonded in a way that was really extraordinary, people who didn't know each other. And you begin with, you know, with outdoors, people were sitting very far away from each other on chairs. And by the end of it, you know, we're all in a huddle together. So that was, you know, remarkable and amazing. So that was the first workshop. And um, a month later, people participated in the second one. Um, which is uh, was was called Aki, and it's with uh, a uh, theater artist, Maya Jose Contreras from Chile. And what she did is, well, these are maps of the neighborhood where people in groups of three had to draw where they were during COVID and what their you know what their places were and then got to discuss. So, you know, I was paired with a home of visiting nurse who goes to people's houses who told me that, who showed, you know, us all the places they were going, but um, then she started with 75 patients and she ended up with 32. So she's telling me that. I'm showing her, this was the grocery store, and I walked in the park, and then I drove to Vermont. So it was just, the differences were just mind-boggling. And yet, we were able to, to talk to each other. And then what we did, and what you're seeing in the back, was to draw body maps. To, we get these. So um, these were drawn on the ground, and people were asked to talk, to draw where COVID 
the experiences sit in our bodies. And then um, we hung them up and we performed some of the emotions that we saw there. And, uh, you know, you, some people used words, some people didn't use words. They're pretty remarkable. The process was remarkable. And the results are pretty remarkable. And I've never really done anything quite like that. Uh, and then we, you know, discussed them again in groups of three and, and interpreted each other. So by the time that was over, we were pretty, pretty bonded. Um, and, um, and there was another exercise that we did with Maria Jose, which was, uh, which, which is how she begins her workshop, which is that people go around in a circle with, with a match and tell uh, something about their experience of, with COVID, but only while the match is burning, and then the next person does it. So that's the warm up to then, uh, to then you know sort of draw the body maps. So those were you know sort of our fall. Uh, our two fall workshops, which then ended up in a larger uh, sort of community event, which I will just show you and then hope we can talk. Um, so we had a postcard project. We had a, a big event, a gathering for COVID in front of the church with uh, Sing Harlem Choir and um, candlelit walk and just a real ritual gathering on December 5th. But to prepare for that, we asked people to draw postcards that, that responded to two prompts, what have we lost and learned from COVID, and how can we heal and grow together? And we did that in the workshops, but people also contributed, and now they're you know, on the website. And they're really minimalist, because there's not much you can fit on a postcard. So both with the body map and the postcard, I found it very frustrating because the, the language that we are able, you are able to use on something like that is so almost cliched, right? I mean, you're drawing your body map and you want to draw how much you miss, you know, your grandkids and you want to avoid having little hearts, you know, on the map because it seems like such a thing. But how do you, you know, how do you do that? And the postcard was a little bit like that. But then I began to think that this, these are not individual stories. We're really constructing a collective story. And I think that's sort of the point of the project, is to build community and construct this, this collective story. And then, you know, some of them are beautiful and some of them are cliches and, you know. Um, but somehow doing this with others seemed very significant point here is to build community. So before the project started, the New York Times had this really beautiful few pages um, on a Sunday where they had asked people to um, photograph an object that somebody left who, that they lost and write a few things about it. And we were thinking about, you know, everybody in their own apartment doing that. What would it mean to be together to do that? And so that's the point of the project. And so let me just, we just had another workshop on Saturday, which is when I traveled on Sunday, so I was just going to um, read you one, the prompts from that workshop, which I thought were, were really interesting, uh, because it was a, uh, we're now moving from marking loss to thinking about justice and repair and demand, because we're going to have a big exhibition on uh, April 23rd that will involve some of the work that community members have made and some artists work uh, were not in our project and a set of performances in, um, in the in the cathedral as well so um, we're preparing to move from mourning to repair and justice and how do you ask for justice so um, our workshop leader Noni Carter was a wonderful young writer uh, talked, did uh, with the group a visualization activity whose goal is to get into the correct register for our collaborative activity on the creative appeal to pull our embodied experiences upwards toward the part of us that engages in an imaginative act. To move beyond interacting and acknowledging our COVID stories toward mobilizing them, to become attuned to the possibility within our experiences that move them into demands we make of ourselves, our world, and our communities. 
So there are visualization activities to close our eyes for five minutes, actually, to visualize a plant or a tree that you feel represents who you've become during the past two years, and to recognize the stories that nourish you. So she begins with the soil, focus as, on the soil as a space of nourishment that houses the experiences that shaped our current selves from COVID and sit with that for a while. And then imagine branches and shoots that come out of the soil that begin to grow. And each one of these represent a demand, I want. What do I want? We could do it here. And then imagine a second shoot or branch and that represents I hope, I dream, I wish. And the third one is I ask that. And then the fourth one would be I am grateful for this. And then um, the end is one day I see. This is, you know, and doing this in a group and talking about it, we had little leaves, we wrote on it. Um, we then tried to construct the demand in small groups, which is really hard. Like, who do we ask it from? Who do we address? The government? Well, to abstract. What are we asking for? Justice? Abolition? You know, all of this seems so abstract, but coming out of this kind of soil and tree growing made it possible to become more uh, concrete. And in my group, I was with two other people, and you know, I want to, you know, like reframe society and ask the government for this or that. But the people in my group wanted to um, address themselves, and I just couldn't figure it out. I mean, um, but what they really wanted is to get themselves to a place where they felt like they had a voice that was able to make a demand, that they were worthy, and it was all about worth. That's what they wanted to think about. Uh, I mean, we were very, from very different places in this group of three. And I felt so humbled to think that I had absolutely no problem wanting to write a letter to the mayor or to the governor or to the president asking, you know, for better health care and whatever. But they felt like they needed to feel worthy enough to be able to have that voice. So that was very, very humbling. For me. Anyway, I'll stop here because I could go on and talk forever. Um, Thank you. Wow, that's very uh, wow, evocative and rich. And uh, so, yeah, the connections to memory studies are there, but you know, right. um, yeah. I want. I mean, while people are thinking of things, the one thing that I was thinking about, especially toward the end of your presentation, was the AIDS emergency, HIV AIDS. And I wondered if you had talked about that or worked through that in your group, because it seems to me one of the obvious analogies for the kind of inequities of loss and the geographies of loss and the, the, the connection between mourning and militancy, mm -hmm. and of course, the mm -hmm. classic, you know, topos there. So I don't, that's just the thing that this sort of speaks to me about, in a way. And it seems like... I've been thinking, I've thought about it a couple of times as a sort of interesting resource, thinking about ACT UP and AIDS mm -hmm. activism, as an interesting resource for thinking of other kinds of crises. I've thought about it in terms of like climate stuff, you know, mm -hmm. where it's a matter of life and death, you know, in a, in a real sense, and involves science as well as other you know, politics. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think of it here too, where you have a health emergency, which is also a social that's a great question and yes of course that's probably the analogy especially in New York you know in the US right. that that came to mind also in terms of how a memorial is constructed I was just speaking to a reporter for the New York Times who has a piece coming out on um, asking demanding um, COVID memorial in New York City mm -hmm. and she told and I think it, I think it's coming out probably Sunday I'm not sure um, and she said the first place she went to was the people who worked on the Gates Memorial, which is a very small and kind of unassuming memorial in, in downtown um, near Christopher Street. Um, and was, you know, took years and years and years to happen. But of course, we had the book, which was a very unique, appropriate to that moment. Um, 
I think it's totally, I mean, it, it is a good analogy. It's limited. It, it, <laughs> yeah, it's limited in its, you know, in its um, power of analogy because, you know, is the people affected were, you know, a smaller group. It wasn't as global, but the, um, but but the, um, and and they could be kind of separated out in a way through prejudice and vilification in a way. But of course, then you know, it, it also spread, and also. For, how long it took to find, um, you know, to find a cure, a cure or even a medication, just such a long time. Um, whereas with COVID, it was just much sooner. So yeah, I think I, you know, I don't know how much of that has been explored, but I think there's definitely a lot more, more to do there. And and of course, as is true of anything in a city like New York, there are families who've lost, you know, who've suffered those losses so it's compounded by those histories as well which is really important. Um, well I was thinking about you began with the zip code and I know there's a portion that's more focused on the zip code which we didn't talk about but I was thinking about um, how through the pandemic there has been so much data visualization about illness. Mm -hmm and hot spots and rates and making a, a sort of loose leap to Ukraine and thinking about the charting of exit and violence. And um, it struck me that one is not accustomed to the data visualization of healing and recovery. And the same thing that was constructed for COVID rates by zip code that you opened with. Um, you know, scholars of public health, for example, have the tools to track rates of recovery and economic and physical and mental well-being healing, but we are not accustomed to tracking these processes. But as we move from a COVID moment to a very long shadow of a post-COVID moment that we don't know how long it will last, and confront things like um, like the fact that certain children will have fallen permanently behind, whereas others will be more resilient, you mm -hmm. know, academically mm -hmm. and therefore also professionally, economically, and as well. Um, it strikes me that we very broadly need this kind of attention to recovery and repair um, to the extent to which we were attentive to um, to trauma, mm -hmm. and yet I'm I'm curious if you have encountered or if your group is engaged with this idea um, of, of tracking this process, not just through your workshops, but almost sort of demographically mm -hmm. through cities. So we had this roundtable, Why Zip Codes, which was with epidemiologists, and I mean, you know, Greg Gonzalez writes for the Nation. I mean, you've you've heard of some of these people. They are, you know, data visualization people and mapping, uh, sort of mapping people. Um, Laura Kurgan, you know, who's a Columbia colleague, uh, moderated it. Um, and we thought we, we needed to explain zip codes. First of all, what's the history? Can everything, can mapping through zip codes actually produce um, change, social change? Um, and what is being studied and what is being tracked and what, what can we know through the demographic. So we initially talked to Laura Kurgan, who um, is part of the, um, what is it called, the director of the Center for Spatial Research. She's also an artist who makes really beautiful things with maps. So we thought we could work together and she was very eager to, to pair with us. But because she said, we just do it from up here and you're on the ground and we really need to kind of merge these two approaches and meet each other and it seemed almost impossible so this was a fascinating roundtable I really learned a lot about mapping and spatial research um, epidemiology the lack of data from the CDC that these people are getting because of privacy questions the impossibility of, of finding out a lot of the stuff that they really felt they needed to know so it, it looked like there was a huge struggle, but 
a number of our community participants came to this virtual project, but they couldn't figure out what it had, how it had anything to do with what we were doing. So there's a kind of disconnect between this kind of bird's eye view of a map and the map of the U.S. and the map of even you know a neighborhood or New York City, and the kind of um, on the ground work of repair that you know people are doing in all of these different communities. I still haven't figured how we can bring these together, um, but I think the knowledge that you're talking about that people are actually gathering is going to be crucial. Mm -hmm. And we know it already from school systems, you know, different school systems and, um, and you know, um, community health centers and so on. But how you connect these approaches seems really difficult to me right now. But I think it's a, it's a really important thing to do. What? Yeah, you're, I thought you... No, but I, I, I can say something. Go ahead. <laughs> I was thinking about the temporality of emergency that you were just also starting with. Mm -hmm. um, and it struck me very interesting because, I mean, as I told you, as a person from Israel, I kind of feel like certain areas, spatial areas, uh, certain borders, sort of uh, certain places have state of emergency, a constant state of emergency, right? If we're talking about the way in which like Palestinians experience things like the pandemic is obviously sort of different than the way in which Americans came to experiences in a sense of like and in a state of constant emergency uh, on the temporality of, of this emergency as if something's going wrong all every given second. And I'm just wondering if it's not if it's just a matter of not experiencing it before, or is it something new about these past three years? Has it really is it really a new temporality, or is it just sort of like the temporality of let's say um, I don't know another geography that is coming here all of a sudden, maybe a kind of a return of our interest in a different way. I don't know. I it's just like I thought. You feel like living in Israel, you're always in a constant state of emergency. I can say that, that and I'm, I'm thinking about Palestinians, it's like even more in, in right. intense, right? Right, right, um, right, right. There's this book uh, by Yael Velva uh, called um, Living Emergency, where she kind of, kind of conceptualizes mm -hmm. putting Palestinians in a state of emergency as a way to manufacture control um, and, and kind of uh, encourage subordination. Uh -huh. Um, and it's all about temporality, right? Make sure they wait in line, uh, come back next week, the offices are closed, and you come back next week, and it's a holiday. But their life is in a state of emergency. I'm just like, I don't know, I don't have like a well articulated thought here. It's just, I'm wondering whether it's actually something new or just something that all of a sudden looks like other parts of the world. They're not, it's not new for them, I guess. I mean, we're in a constant state of emergency even from the climate crisis, right? But we don't experience it that way necessarily, maybe more so now, right? Um, so, I mean, my question was more about how do you do the, this idea of suspension together with the emergency? You know, that seemed like that seemed like a way to describe this moment because you have to put off your plans. You can't travel. You can't start school. You, you know, start, you go home again. So, I mean, there's... A little bit of that, you know, waiting for the vaccine, but then there's some new outbreak. So that seemed like the suspension, but the state of emergency, of course, is there for the, the life as emergency. is there for many, many populations. You think of refugees at the U.S. border, you think of Palestinians, you think right now in Ukraine, I mean, in so many places. And, and there are people who, you know, we walk by every day, you know, where am I going to spend the night? Homeless, right? So, um, so that's um, you know, African Americans who are arrested for no reason. I mean, so yes, that's certainly the case. But it, you know, to me, it was more like how to put that together with this kind of suspended present of the pandemic, where it doesn't seem like. But maybe that's also the case for so many people. You know, you think of under occupation. Yeah. Example, what under occupation? Right, right. right. I was, you know, yeah. I guess it would be house. interesting to think about right. how, like, lines of you know, racial or gender, right, or, right, or right, colonial lines sort of play into this, and how it impacts differently across these 
different contexts. Yeah, so I mean that's really interesting. And is it have we have people in the U.S. lived that way also, or are, is the or you know or did the pandemic bring a different relationship to time? So that's really an open question for me. I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd love your thoughts on it. Um, yeah. I, I'd love to jump in and not necessarily answer the question, but extend <laughs> with another question, um, if that's okay. I So your project made me think a lot about um, Arundhati Roy's article at the very beginning mm -hmm. of the pandemic, the pandemic is a portal. Right. And it felt like that was a moment, in part because COVID felt so exceptional. And this gets to your question of like, is it was it exceptional just for people who had not experienced living in a state of constant emergency, right? But there was sort of this sense, at least for part of the world, that this was an exceptional event and that mm -hmm. that opened up a kind of possibility that hadn't been there before. Um, I mean, there were sort of discussion of how it was like a test run for climate change, right? A more serious global climate emergency, um, how the world was going to come together and deal with that, right? So this was like a crisis that we could use to imagine a different future. Um, and particularly given the future-oriented nature of a lot of the workshops that, that you did, um, I was, I, I mean, I have felt that, that somewhat cynically, <laughs> I have felt that that spirit has waned. Uh, as what has waned as the pandemic has gone on. Um, you know, there was sort of a lot of energy, I think, because they also came at the moment of George Floyd. Um, and it's obviously difficult to carry on with that kind of um, activist energy. Uh, so I was curious if you had thoughts about that, like how the future-oriented temporality of the workshops where we're um, in this moment of like the extended shadow of COVID, um, you know, not quite out of it, uh, have sort of struggling to define what it would mean to be out of it, what normal would mean um, after the pandemic. If that kind of temporality or future-oriented temporality of some of the workshops was different from the kind that we saw in Roy's article, mm -hmm. um, right, which felt like this sort of more radical break. Um, I guess, yeah, so like how does future, how does this future-oriented temporality also work with like the state of suspended emergency, mm -hmm. right? If it's not like exceptional anymore, how do we sustain the kind of activist energy that sometimes comes out of those exceptional moments? Yeah, no, it, you know, it was such an interesting trajectory, right? I, I, I don't remember exactly when Roy's article came out. Mm -hmm. It was early, well, before yeah, George Floyd it was in May, April or May. Yeah. Um, and there were a number of panels. Haymarket Books sponsored yeah. a number of them on, you know, what what could the world be? I mean, this is a moment of to reboot, and we really we could use it as a portal. And it was, you know, everybody was holding on to that because we were also in the midst of Trump, right? So which which was a daily emergency, right? So um, we're we're not quite, you know, we're a little bit out of that at least, but um, so. Yeah, um, and you're absolutely right that that sense of the future is open, that even maybe with the election, you know, that was kind of certainly with the activism that the, emerged in the summer um, of 2020 after the George Floyd murder, murder um, was, seemed, you know, very urgent, right? And, and that was building community. Um, but of course, only some people could participate because of um, danger of infection and so on. I don't. I would not say that our workshops are all future oriented. The project is future oriented, but maybe even the project is not future. It's it's really about pausing, just pausing and experiencing and having a safe place to kind of reflect, but not just reflect intellectually, but really pause with some of the emotions that we haven't even been, been able to allow ourselves to feel because we just had to deal with the with the emergencies, right? So just creating a space where people could pause and connect and build community in some ways and build trust so that the future oriented stuff can happen later. So now the you know turning to the future, turning to a demand, that's also not so much future. It's just pausing to think of well what do we actually want? And how can we get there? So that's that sort of seems the task right now. Of course, you know, it's not 
therapy or you know it's it's really you know allowing um, some of allowing finding some pathways through which some of these ideas and practices can emerge that aren't the well the rote kinds of ways that we've been responding to things so it's really more about a pause I would say um, the pause is about the future of course right um, and it's about changing course um, it's about reactive activating some kind of hope in communities that have been devastated uh, right now uh, there's a, a new you know sort of new dimension of the project that we're doing which is not about future at all it's really about a company forming small groups among the participants to take each other to some spaces that have meant a lot either that have sustained people or that have that they've lost and telling stories about them to each other so it's a kind of accompaniment to mark, you know, to mark these these places. Um, so it, it, this is really about finding a safe way or to articulate some of the, you know, some of the stuff that happened, rather than moving, you know, saying let's move, let's let's get back to normal. So it is kind of our adaptive Roy inspired in the sense that we don't want to go back to to whatever the normal was. Um, and if it's a, and, and it is about a portal because but but the idea is we have to pause um, and think. And it was very interesting to talk to Mara Gay in, at the New York Times about what would a COVID memorial, where would you put it in New York City? I said, I asked her because of course it should be in Staten Island, where, which is you know a very you know mainly right wing you know immigrant community where that had very, very devastating losses, way beyond any other borough. Uh, but nobody wants to go there, you know, you have to take a ferry. But, I mean, that's the place that you really would have to do, you know. So she was saying, well, she was thinking of the stumbling stones as a, as a different approach, which I thought was really interesting to have stoppers tied in for people that have been lost in different communities. And, you know, like in Europe, you would have, like, 25 in front of one building in the Bronx and maybe two out of Park Avenue, you know, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that would be interesting. So, you know, there it would be interesting to think of different models or, you know, you could have commemorative days and rituals, and, but how do we mark, you know, how do we mark this particular thing? So yes, it's about the future, but not, yeah. not in a kind of linear way. Um, yeah, yeah I, I do have a question, um, a pivot, pivoting a little bit, but I think related, but I was really taken, I really struck by the story you told of getting to a point where it was not just, so you you mentioned in my notes somewhere I wrote down, but starting off with this idea of like commemorating the loss, thinking about repair, and then eventually making demands, and there was that moment where you felt ready to make demands writing, you know, writing those letters, but um, some of the people you were talking to were like, well, I need to feel the self-worth in order to make the demands. So I really appreciated you sharing that as a moment of sort of, you know, your own learning or realization, and I just imagine that coming, forming this project, and sort of brainstorming this project with other, you know, uh, scholars, intellectuals, maybe, I'm, I'm just curious how you, you're thinking um, maybe changed as you did start to engage more with the community, or if there are other moments of, wow, okay, I haven't thought about it like that, like maybe we have to pivot, or maybe um, we have to change our approach. So just, yeah, I'm just so curious mm -hmm. since um, I feel like bringing together more like, academic practices like don't always work in, in like the organizing or community settings. So. It's been really difficult, I have to say. I mean, this is being reported. Yeah. This project has been an, an enormous challenge yeah. in every single way. First of all, because there's so much organizational work, it, there's so many people involved, and we're not all at our most composed right now through this whole experience. We're very difficult, and we're all difficult. You know, I'm, I'll include myself, and uh, and we don't, you know, we're we're collaborating, but we don't always see eye to eye. We have our own ideas, what are about what our priorities are. So there are many different 
priorities that are at the same time. We, we, we feel a huge responsibility for having gathered participants to, to listen. And I feel like we invented these projects and these, but is this what you know would have would have been much better to start you know going to community centers and saying okay what what do you think would work or what, what should it be right um, that would have been a lot more time consuming and you know I wanted to learn a lot about the communities and go out into the city and into these neighborhoods more you know we Omicron happened so we weren't able to go on all these walks that we wanted to take and have people take us to places. Um, so a lot of, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of try to forge ahead with a project, you have a grant, and then really stop to listen and to see what will work. So of course there's lots of critique, you know, what's appropriative? We have, we're making a film, we're documenting. Is it okay, you know, to, to document um, these things? If the people really agree, either they feel okay to say no, I would rather not, I mean, is the, are they gonna be okay? So, so many questions, um, and I feel like I've learned a lot, but I haven't really even quite processed everything I've learned. But um, it's just the anecdote I told before. When you're an academic, you you talk a lot and you talk well, and it comes naturally. It's just much harder to listen, and it's just easier to say, "Well, this is how it should be done." So, we have, you know, there's a lot of, um, it, it's very humbling mm -hmm. to see some of the pushback, some of the critiques, and, you know, it's, they're very uh, experienced theater workshop leaders that we have, and we have this candlelight march on a walk through the neighborhood on, on December 5th, and, uh, you know, it, it kind of ended up being a mess. A lot of people joined, and we, we were a mess, and it wasn't orderly, and you know, didn't look good in the film. And and you know, some of our community participants, like a nurse, said, "I'll tell you how this should be done. You just number people one, two, one, two, and they walk in pairs." And you know, it's sort of it was so simple, but it was wonderful that you know people are now feeling free to kind of say, "This is how you should do it," rather than. So I think we built. You know, community in that particular way. You have to go. I'm so sorry. To step mm -hmm. up. Thank you. Um, and some of us have been better at involving people from the get go than others. So we have uh, this wonderful curator, Ishin Erdogan, who you know, who's from Turkey, who's curating the this exhibition that we're having. So that's a huge question. We want some well known artists because that will bring people to it and but a lot of our community participants are artists and are we gonna say we have guest artists and community I mean how are we gonna talk about this sort of inherently hierarchical thing that we don't it's not hierarchical we don't want it to be we're all you know sort of everybody's involved um, but um, so that's been you know this an, another huge discussion but Ishan has been fabulous about forming a curatorial group among um, out of our groups of participants, and they're all conceiving the exhibit together. And I sort of wish we had done the whole project that way and started much more slowly to build the project with people from different parts of the community rather than, you know, kind of preconceiving and, and draw, bringing people in. And that would have taken a lot more time, but I think working with communities does take a lot more time. So it's not like writing a syllabus of telling your class. Yeah, but it's like building the syllabus with the students. Well, that's also being done in academia now, but it's a lot, you know, more risky and more time consuming. So, yeah, I've learned a tremendous amount. Um, not all of it, you know, affirming, right? Because uh, there's a lot of critique and self-critique, but that's it's part of it. You know, it's it's sort of part of the process. If you can create a space where people are willing to be critical, that's also a good thing as long as it's not destructive. Sure. The question might be um, partially like logistical, but also like reflective. Um, to sort of follow up on Jen's question, you talked about how like 
received a grant and wanted to forge ahead um, to capture the, the present moment because of the, um, obviously because of like, the, the ongoing nature of, of this. I'm kind of wondering what are like, um, like is the funding limited? What, what are the next steps that you're like thinking about after? How, how is this, like, is, is there like an end date? Um, or are you able to incorporate some of the things that you've learned and like transform them? Um, just sort of like next steps, if you will. That's a great question, and I should have said from the beginning. We're, I, I, you know, I said we knew what we were doing and we told people what to do. We're building this as we go along. I mean, we've had to shift course all the time, right? And uh, the, I don't know if any of you know the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, it's, um, it's constantly, it's unfinished. It's constantly in construction. It has a lot of scaffolding up because there was a fire. So there's always repair being done. And we think of that as a really happy image for the whole project. It's a bad repair and it's, and it's a scaffolding and we keep you know moving the scaffolding around and putting things on, hanging things on it. That's pretty much the best we can do. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, my dream for the rest of the project is first of all, we're gonna have, um, some workshops this summer that we're calling train to trainers. So some of the community participants can be can learn the techniques with some of the workshop leaders and then lead workshops themselves. And maybe we'll, you know, that could be easily be expanded. We're gonna have a toolkit of, you know, some of these practices, the ones that have worked well and you know, improve the ones that haven't worked well, so that it could be replicable in other places. And I think, you know, I think it is really, you know, the workshops themselves and the process of it is, is really effective. So so we want to publish that. Um, will there be a book? There's a lot of discussion about that. I mean, uh, because a, a number of our students, uh, public humanities graduate students, have been writing about it. Some of them are going to give papers and conferences. So, you know, that's, that's sort of in progress. But my hope, actually, is that at some point we could raise enough money to invite local artists to so to make suggest plans for a COVID memorial practice or project in these neighborhoods or in New York City, and that um, some of our partnering institutions would adopt some of them. I mean, not necessarily a built memorial, but even the plans for one or ideas about one, and that we could sponsor a larger conversation about how this period could be remembered and what kind of memorialization would be appropriate. So that's that was my idea for the next for the next stage. Um, we you know we're we're spending our, our funding very fast, so we have to, we have to raise more money for that. But I think it's doable, and I think people would really welcome it actually. Uh, and sort of that would be a way to expand the conversation. Other hopes would be that some of this you know what I told you the project I told you the visualization one. You know that that people could take it to schools or to senior centers or you know that it, rather than gathering people in one space it, this could be done in you know these kinds of workshops could be done in other spaces just to provide the kind of nurturing that we, we feel it, it could provide in, in many other places but you know that's not my work i mean it, it, it's very hard you know it's very hard for some of us to actually do that and make that happen it was harder during COVID because we couldn't, you know, I would have wanted to go to these community centers or the senior centers and talk to people and see how to how to make it happen, but everything had to be on phone call or Zoom or email. So now I think it might be easier to at least have some other pilot projects that would resemble this one. You're actually kind of already answered my question, um, but I did, um, because it was talking about when you mentioned the conversation that you had with the New York Times um, journalist on how places to put, mm -hmm. it, put this um, memorial for COVID in it, the obvious spot being Staten Island. But immediately I was like, would Staten Island even want it there? Exactly. Um, yeah. And so I guess it was, and you, so you kind of already addressed it, looking at uh, local artists. And, uh, but I guess, are you, is that part of this project? Is trying to figure that out of which kind of artists you would want to create a solution. I mean, I would actually want to have an open call. Right. And I mean with uh, and, and not really a competition, just to gather ideas. I you know, 
you've all read James Young's work on memorials, and when the Berlin Memorial, you know, huge debate was going on, he said, the debate is really more interesting than the memorial. Um, and that's what I would want to create as a conversation. And that's why we're doing these roundtables, too, to kind of see what was the process of deciding on, you know, in Charlottesville, um, you know, what the memorial should be, or, you know, um, the more memorial to the enslaved laborer um, should look like, and what, what, you know, how the communities participate in that, and just sort of learn from these processes. The one that was the most amazing was Doris Salcedo's, um, God, what is it called, that she did in Bogota. Uh, do you all know Doris Salcedo, Colombian uh, artist, uh, memorial artist? And after the end of the FARC, um, you know, insurgent season, you know, she's a you know very big um, artist in Colombia. She has projects at the Tate Modern, where she did a kind of gash in the floor of the Tate Modern, for example. So very, very well known. And um, she managed to get the park to give her all the arms that they had, all the weapons, because she told them she was going to build a memorial. And uh, she had them melt it down <laughs> completely and install a floor out of the you know the weapons a floor of a of a gallery space an art space and during the installation she brought together women who had been sexually abused during the conflict and they got to pound the floor and get it in shape by pounding it okay so amazing work so everybody's like well, wait a minute where's the memorial what are you you're walking on um and so to me that's just such an incredible example but of course you have to be a very powerful artist to be able to do that but how can you how you can transform violence into <sighs> exactly but even piece. more so right yeah. i mean in some way so um so those are the kinds of things but but i would you know Ideally, it would be an open call uh, in different neighborhoods and to say, well, you know, in this part of Manhattan, which is Harlem, Washington, has South Bronx, it's very related to Queens, I guess we could, you know, these are all places that have suffered very differently or experienced very, very different experiences during COVID. Um, how would you do it? Um, and people are already proposing memorials I and mean, there have already been designs in, in different parts of the world, and, but we thought, well, maybe it's too fast. I mean, that's another question. What's the time of, what's the temporality of memorialization? When do you do it? Um, and what role should it play in a community? How would it, you know, contribute to healing? Um, those are really huge questions. Questions, comments, thoughts? The last question I had was actually the very last thing about Tech Rally was just to, if you had any hesitations or just, you know, um, yeah, I guess hesitations about calling out for uh, artists to think of memorial ideas when it's, when we don't even know the end date or, you know, how can we yeah. think about memorialization? But I think you kind of yeah, point. well, it, I mean, that's exactly the question. But then, when is it over is always such a big question. I mean, it's even a question about, you know, some of the histories we all work on. When is it over? I mean, is slavery over? Well, the, you know, is, you know, and people always say that with, with work on the Holocaust. Well, you're working on this very short period. Well, you know, so, and, but to me, it's more like, what does memory do now? What we do? What do we need it for? Mm -hmm. And so it's, and we know that these things are not. Over. I mean, long COVID is a huge phenomenon. The losses, um, you know, kids being behind in reading. I mean, these things are going to go on forever. So it's never going to be the right time. And then, you know, will there be new variants? What are the global effects? You know, on the sort of very unequal vaccination rates in different parts of the globe. So. I don't think we're going to see the end date. Um, yeah. 
So the question is, what do people need to acknowledge the, the losses that they've suffered and acknowledge this other thing about, has this provided a portal to something new? So one of the things we're doing, I'll just end with that. Um, one of the artists for in our exhibition is um, is creating a project called a Depository of Anonymous Feelings. So she has a phone number that you can call and you can leave a message of up to three minutes. Tell a story, sing a song that sustained you, play, you know, whatever. And these will be, you know, edited and then in the exhibition you'll be able to pick up a telephone and listen. And we're hoping she wants to then install it in different sites in New York so other people can contribute. Um, so it's very beautiful. And so all of this is about storytelling and gathering stories and, you know, witnessing and co-witnessing um, in different, in many different formats, through a body map, through a, you know, phone message in many different ways. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing this project with us and talking with us about these issues which are, are pressing and all around us and actual. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing the conversation with you tomorrow. So hey, thanks so thank much. Thank you.